It is a huge honor today to be interviewing Mark Murphy. Um, you're really a legend in my mind. I mean, you, you really are. You, you, you have a legacy of teaching practice management of the Pink Institute. I don't think you get any more legendary than that. I spent five weeks of my life down there um, with Erwin Becker. Um, you also were with Mercer. That was with Inti Asmanji. I mean, that was a huge, huge, and still is. And uh, he went on, I think, to do Scottsdale Center. Yeah. That was with Mercer at one time, or then they spun off or something. But, uh, but, but I mean, out of 2 million dentists on earth, you have taught at two of the largest, most prestigious, legendary institutes ever on practice management. So kudos to you, buddy. That, I mean, you, you're crushing it. Well, thanks, Howard. You know, I've been very fortunate in that I've been in the right place at the right time and, and maybe, you know, picked up the opportunity when presented to me. But um, both those both those organizations were very really open and, and letting me come in and giving me an opportunity to grow and be able to do some of the things that maybe some of them I didn't even know I was capable of doing. So it's, it's really been a fun run in both those institutes, especially Panky, but both those places have been really good to me. And uh, and we also have something else in common. Not only are we both male dentists in America, but uh, a name like Murphy. I know you're Irish, and uh, I I had my family tree done uh, because we're in Arizona, and um, it's, it's it's a lot of Mormons down here, and they are really big into genealogy. So I don't know if any of these listeners know that, but if you go to any Mormon temple, um, they they do genealogy. And I, I went down to Mesa and gave them, you know, started working with a. Uh, 75 year old lady she's volunteering down there and she did my whole family tree it was amazing my two parents four grandparents eight great grandparents were still 100 percent irish so that's awesome why, so why should someone listen to a irish mick named murphy because of murphy's law <laughs> well murphy's law means if something can go wrong it probably will and, and isn't that the way life is um well, Howard, I think they should listen to somebody like me, especially when they think about Murphy's Law, because I've probably made most of the mistakes that they're going to make. I've been around a lot of people who've made a lot of other mistakes, and I think I've learned a lot. And and if I've learned one thing for sure, it's like it's that I'd like to not keep making the same mistakes over and over again and calling it experience. I'd like to make new mistakes. And so when people can listen to other people, people listening to you about how to get a an MBA, you know, in terms of dentistry, people listening to me about practice management or, or Dave Schwarte about financial management and that stuff, you know, they can avoid some of the pitfalls and mistakes. And, and dentistry is hard enough. Dentistry is way hard enough. Well, l let me start with this question because um, I got out in 87 and I'm 52. You got an 81. So what are, what are you, 50? 50... 59 tomorrow. 50, well, happy birthday, buddy. Thank and you. And you're Thank looking you. damn good. You look younger than I am. I, uh, I, everyone would think I was your older brother. Um, so, so we, 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 Stay here, Howard. We've Stay been here. around the block a long time, so uh, uh, we're, we're doing about 7,000 listens per show. A lot of these kids are uh, right out of school. The young ones are really devouring uh, podcasts uh, more so than older people. And I want you to I, I want you to address a, their Murphy's Law. Their Murphy's Law is like, uh, you two older guys, you graduated in the glory days of dentistry, the golden years, and – we graduated with $250,000 in student loans, and there's a corporate dental office on every corner. And, you know, it, it's not like it used to be in the good old days. What would you say to that kid who's been out of school five years, has $250,000 in student loans, and is practicing across the street from a corporate dental office? Fair question. Um, and, and a good perspective for us to start with. I think there's an important differentiation, too, between what I kind of want to say and what I'd actually say. What I want to say is every generation <laughs> thinks they've got it tougher than the previous generation. I'd want, to, I'd want to give them some historical perspective on our parents who walked both ways uphill in the snow four miles to and from school told us how tough they had and how easy we had it. And we told our kids the same thing and they're going to tell their kids the same thing. So the first thing I'd say that I wouldn't actually say what I'd be thinking is there's this historical perspective that the golden age of dentistry was and we're living in something that's not. And I think that's a bunch of crap. I think it's probably the best time you could ever be a dentist today. Better opportunities than we had when we got out of school. But that's perspective. And I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't embrace that in the first part of the conversation with them, even though they're going to listen to this in the podcast. Instead, I'd say, I feel your, your pain. Because not only are they graduating with $273,000 in, in 2013, $273,000 in debt, not only is there a corporate dental office opening on every corner, but the demand, the 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 patient demand, the U.S. census patient demand, consumer price is declining, flat at best. The supply of dentists is up. 
The net operating income of the average dentist is down over 15% in the last 10 years. Reimbursements are sucking the hind part of the animal. It's horrible. And so we're in this big mess. So you could look at that and say, that's a perfect storm. And you could say, it's a horrible time to be a dentist. Or you could say, like a sailor says, when the winds change, I can set my sails differently. And with those kind of headwinds coming at you, probably the the worst thing to do is to embrace that language. The worst thing to do is fall into that trap of what all that negativity is and say that there's no hope and there's no opportunity. Instead, I would say that polarization for that segment of dentistry would make it easier for anyone if they wanted to, to practice however they wanted, to practice free of dentistry, without insurance reimbursements as, as their main income stream, without participating with every PPO and usual customary and reasonable fee adjustment that came along. It'd be the best time ever to be a fee-for-service insurance independent dentist, comma, if that's what they chose to do. Because I'd never say to somebody, that's what they should do. I'd say, what do you want to do? What's your dream? What's your vision? And if that's your vision, hell, you can get there. Now, it's easier now than it probably would have been 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. You know, you you we we do have a great perspective being our age because uh, you know when um you know you hear all these people talking about how bad the economy is and it's like you know how would you like to practice during the Civil War when eight hundred thousand Americans were killed and everything was made of wood and they fought with fire and burned down entire cities and then to have World War One at the same time as the flu epidemic the flu epidemic alone dropped five percent of the planet that was happening during World War One. And then, and then World War Two. I mean, I mean, the, you know, you really do need perspective. I, I get a lot of perspective from uh, reading hundred-year-old dental books, and from lecturing in um, fifty countries around the world. And it's funny how a country, when you're inside a country, um, you think um, every, everybody's drinking the same Kool-Aid, and then you go to another country. So I want to ask this: like, when you go to uh, Brazil or Latin America, you go to Africa, you go to Asia. There's no dental insurance. That's right. Why? New Zealand. Take a, take a country where it's not a third world country, but it's a first world country like ours. New Zealand, no dental insurance. Yeah, so, so, so why, do, um, why do almost all American dentists believe you have to take insurance? And Because are you saying that you don't have to? Is that what you're Absolutely. saying? Okay, Absolutely. So, so why does everyone in the United States believe that a human would never go to the dentist to fix their teeth without dental insurance? When, yeah. when there's no insurance in China, India, or Brazil. So, so, but the dentistry is a little different there too. But so, the first part when you said, "Would I say that you don't have to take insurance?" I'd say yes, but that's not a that's not a change you'd make willy nilly. There'd be a process for doing that. It would take time. You'd evolve from from insurance dependency to insurance independency. It might take two, three, four, five years, but you can do it. And, and you can't do it everywhere, but you could do it almost everywhere. So, when I say that, most of us fell into this trap about taking insurance because Howard, when I graduated from dental school in 1981, crown fees were three, 350 bucks. Insurance covered 12 or $1,500. So you could walk into a patient, look at them and say, you need this, 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 and this. They could say, all those crowns, yeah. Does my insurance cover? And you say, hell yes. And then half the dentists in Michigan would waive the copay as well, which was 10% because GM, Ford, and Chrysler all had very robust dental plans. So people were overbilling, taking 90% of the fee, and they were discounting their services. But remember, at 300 bucks a crown, you could do four or five or six crowns in a patient. Pretty successful dental treatment back then, back in 1981, two, three, four, five. Well, then as you know, fees might have gone up, costs might have gone up, demand might have gone up, but the insurance coverage didn't change. If we'd indexed it from inflation from when it was first invented in 1954 to today, we might have nine or $10,000 worth of coverage, but instead it still covers 12 or 1500 bucks. So today when you say to a patient, you need this, 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 and this, they say, does my insurance cover it? And you say, no, not even the first crown. It covers part of the first crown. So it'll cover a crown and two cleanings a year. It's not insurance. Insurance is when the third party takes a risk for catastrophic loss. And there's nothing catastrophic about 1200 bucks to the average person. To, to some people on very limited incomes, 1200 bucks can be a catastrophe. But to most of us, it's not. People have money for what they want. So we feel like we have to take insurance because, you know, sorry, sorry, Howard, but I'm going to point the finger at you and me. We and the dentists of our generation taught our patients to think that way. So now you fast forward to today, you get 30 years, 40 years down the road, insurance covers the same, and we and our patients are living in the same paradigm about insurance and how it's responsible for our health, and it's just not working anymore.
The good news, though, is if we taught them to think that way, we can teach them to think a different way. We have that freedom. And do you think that um, England, the United Kingdom, is just ahead of its time? Because when you, when I got out of school, England had 14,000 dentists, and they all participated with the NHS. And now I've been out of school 28 years, and now 5,000 of their 14,000 have said, I, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm going, like you say, I'm going, going private. Sir, I'm going private. Because, because well, I, I think what dental insurance has done, uh, let, me, let me ask this question. My, my, my thought is um, if you make a bottle of water and, and you make this bottle of water and you sell it for $1 and you net a dime, let's say the dime is like the, the, the cap. Well, if you want to make another dime because you need money for family, life, whatever, the hardest thing to do is make a whole nother bottled water, sell it and collect the money to make your another dime. The easiest way to make another dime is to raise that first bottle of water from a dollar to a dollar ten. Now you've made 20 cents and that, that's the easiest way. But don't you think that these PPOs and what they've done is that they've taken that dime away? I mean, they, yeah, they, exactly. they, they, they you, lower the bottle. fee to where you, you're basically doing free dentistry. So let me take your bottled water story the other way. If you're selling bottled water and you happen to make 30 cents every time you sell a bottle of water and you say, this is wonderful, and along comes a PPO and says, if you don't sell the bottled water for 15 cents less, give me a 15% discount, then all your patients are going to go buy bottled water somewhere else. So you lower your fee to now 85 cents, and now you only make 15 cents on that bottle of water. You have to, you have to sell twice as many bottles of water as you did in the initial example. So in a dental practice, we'd have to do twice as many crowns, twice as many fillings, twice as many cleanings, twice as many everything. And what we've seen is that that fee shift. In business, they call it the average sale price. You've got a business degree. ASP, the average sale price is declining, which means we either increase the number of activities that we have and sell them more, or we create efficiencies, or we go offshore for our laboratory work, or we use our gloves three times and our suction tips twice and the burr 15 times. We find some other cost advantage to take expense out. And that's not in the best interest of the patients, usually. That's a, that's a tough way to try to make a buck. Cut your way to prosperity. And, I, you know, the, the industry that reminds me the most of dentistry in America is actually uh, cattle, um, the cattle industry. You know, not one Fortune 500 company owns 1% of the cattle market because so many cattle people uh, sell their cattle at a loss because they're a dentist, an accountant, they have another business, and, and they don't understand their costs enough, and they're selling, cow, they're selling meat at a loss. And the Fortune That's 500 perfect. can't go into a business where your competitors are willing to sell at a loss. And I look at dentistry, um, and I, I'm, this is leading up to your functional tracker. I want you to talk about that because the, 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 I, I think the single largest crime in dentistry today is the fact that their practice management system has no accounting software in there. And if, if their staff was clocking in off the, um, off the management information system and you were paying all your bills on the practice management information system and, and the computer knew that you took half an hour do this procedure at a hundred bucks and at your cost was a hundred bucks and then you sign up for a PPO and, and they were going to pay you $90 for that procedure. Then everybody had the data saying, Hey Mark, you sign up with this, you'll lose $10 every time you do this procedure. Then all the dentists would say no, but none of the dentists know their costs. So the problem with PPOs is so many dentists are participating, running them at a loss and not even knowing they're taking profits from fee-for-service cash patients, subsidizing all this garbage they're doing at a loss, and it just makes the industry so much sicker and less healthy. Now, I was wondering, um, you're big in this functional tracker. What, what, does, what does this functional tracker do, and, and what, what market failure in our existing um, Henry Shine's Dentrix, uh, Patterson's Eaglesoft, uh, care streams uh, or soft end. What, what, what is Functional Tracker doing that these companies are not doing? So, so the point that you've made is awesome because when we don't know what our real cost structure is, we don't know the cost of goods, we don't know what our SGNA is. You know, we start to look at a structure and we say, well, I, if I just do a few more of these, or if I pay my team a little bit less, or if I lower my lab bill, I can still eke out a living. But what's been happening in the last ten years? So this is not something we're talking about theoretically. Is there's been a decline. The ADA's data shows there's been a decline of over 15% over the last 10 years of what dentists made on an annual basis when you adjust those all for the same year's value in terms of inflation. So we're making less and less and less money every year doing more and more work. 
So because there's no accounting software that really gives you that capability, and I would add the average dentist, we, we just aren't trained to understand that kind of thinking. We're trained to work in this four-inch sphere, this little Munson radius sphere where this is our happy place. And when we go outside there and we have to manage people or think about business and think about features, advantages, and benefits, and how we sell things, we just go, no, I don't want to do that. I want to just fix stuff. And, and the problem we have is if we're terrible at the business, if we're terrible at management and leadership, we still make... 160, 80, 200 thousand dollars a year is the average income for a dentist. 187 thousand and change. The last recorded number from the ADA. We'll make almost two bills if we're terrible at it. But we might be leaving 50 or 100 thousand dollars on the table. So without that accounting software, we have trouble managing that. Well, that would that would require a great deal of education for the dentist to be able to sort through that information and think that through. But what we could do, quite simply, is if we could identify some behaviors and track those behaviors that impact those results better we might be able to change the numbers, even without some sophisticated understanding of business. Let me explain. Dentrix, Eaglesoft, all the softwares out there do a great job of recording what happened yesterday and telling you what the opportunities were, telling you what the opportunities could be in the future, telling you how much money you made, how many new patients you saw, slicing and dicing your data, production per hour, great. But they're all rear view mirror opportunities for you to look at your practice. If we know that certain behaviors impact those results, we should track those behaviors. And that's what Functional Tracker does. That's what we should all be doing. It's not about my software. It's about just even a paper and a pencil tracking the behaviors that we agree to. So if the team says we should use the intro camera more, why? Because if you use the intro camera more, more patients say yes to treatment recommendations and more of your hygiene patients show up for their next recare visit, then we should be tracking not just how many patients show up for the recare visit, and what our dollar revenue is, we should be tracking how many times per day we use the intro camera. That becomes the critical metric. So the, the solution to the problem is to say, identify the right behaviors, using the intro camera, celebrating things with people, asking for a referral, making the next hygiene visit, making the restorative visit, making the first hygiene visit for a new patient when they come in. What are the behaviors that we could identify that impact the results that we want to change? Because we've got plenty of software that slices and dices the results. We need something that drives, drives the behaviors. I mean, I wear a Fitbit. I wear a Fitbit because it's going to help me measure, monitor, and manage how many calories I eat, how much exercise I do, why? Because I want to lose those last 10 or 15 pounds. I want to get healthy, stay healthy, and look as young as you do, Howard. What I do is I hire my personal trainer to wear that Fitbit. <laughs> And, and you look great on paper. And uh, so, so then, so tell me, um, of Dentrix, Eagle Soft, and Soft, uh, which ones Mo, Larry, and Curly? Uh, you know, they all do a great job. I, I couldn't beat up on any one of them. They all do a great job, but they only do a great job on telling you what happened yesterday or today in your practice. They don't tell you anything about what behaviors are necessary to drive those results. So, so, so how long has this been out? How how do dentists get it? What are you tracking? What's the results? Tell tell us how how it's working. Well, well, thank you, but you know, I, we'll stay, I'd like to stay at a global level. I don't want this to turn into an infomercial about uh, Functional Tracker, but FunctionalTracker.com, but it's functional with a K because we like to be a little fun and funky. So FunctionalTracker with a K.com um, is a website where people can go and look at this stuff. But, but I want to say this again. It's not about my software. It's about if you took your day sheet and you walked into your operatory and you said, Patient number one for my hygienist came in. Did they make a six-month recall appointment? Yes. Put a check mark. Patient number two came in. Did they make a six-month recare appointment? Yes, they did. Patient number three, no. You could track what percentage of the time your hygiene patients were leaving with their next appointment. The average practice is around 70%. Best in class is around 94, 95%. So the difference between 70 and 95%, that 20 points on just a one hygiene uh, one hygienist practice who's maybe working 30 hours a week and seeing 10 patients a day, so maybe they're seeing 40 patients a week, a 20% delta in that number from 70 to 90% is eight more patients or one full day of hygiene. With one more full day of hygiene in your schedule six months down the road because you're starting to track that behavior, and whether you do it manually, if, if that's a pain in the butt, you, you, know, you can buy the software on a monthly subscription basis, but the idea is to track that behavior. And if you track that behavior and impact that result, guess what? That practice is busier six months down the road. And for every dollar of hygiene that they get in revenue, they get another two or three dollars in restorative out of that hygiene revenue. And it's really not about just measuring the revenue, it's about saying how many patients have healthier mouths? How much more of the dentistry that I like to do do I get to do? And then, oh, by the way, that'll also drive revenue. So 
functional tracker has had great success, but so too could you with a pencil and a paper if you had the time, the effort, the energy, and wanted to track that stuff. It's about tracking, not about just how you track. Well, would it be giving away the farm for you if you went over what you're tracking or what the the 80-20 rule, what the most functional behavioral things to track are? No, I, I mean, I, I would I would list them as probably in, in the hygiene arena, the simple most important thing to track is next hygiene opportunity. So when a, when a patient's in, did your hygienist make their next recare appointment? If they did, count that for you. If they didn't, count that against. That should be 90 plus percent. But if the average practice is 70, there's a 20 percent opportunity to improve in the average practice. And we've seen them as low as 50-55. I would also have the hygienist using an intraoral camera more. Lots of practices have an intraoral camera. I, I was once doing a lecture for Mercer, and I asked, how many of you have an intraoral camera in your office? And just about all the hands in the room went up. And when I said, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Now, if you use it at least once a day, keep your hands up. If not, put it down. And I didn't count, but I'll bet 75 to 80% of the hands disappeared. So if you use an intraoral camera more and you show a patient crummy gums, they're more likely to come back for their next six-month appointment. And that means less time, effort, and energy trying to fill your schedule, less time, effort, and energy calling patients, reminding patients, and everything else. In the clinical area, I would say that the greatest opportunity is to track your, your, your case acceptance. Case acceptance is usually at or below 50% in the average practice. And if we start to track case acceptance and then we change our behaviors and create a more curiosity-inducing, a more co-discovery type of new patient experience and exam, if we use the intro camera more, those two behaviors, we'll find more of those patients will say yes. And a 10% change in case acceptance can be $100,000, $150,000 a year. So that's a big delta. On the administrative side in the practice, I would have my admin team celebrating things with patients when they came in, being very social. You know, if they knew that, hey, Howard had been lecturing in, in London, uh, England, and when you came back in for your next cleaning visit, I'd say, so Howard, I understand you were in London. How was it? Oh, and I'd listen to you tell me about your trip, and you'd feel good about telling me. I'd feel good about hearing. But I'd celebrate something with you that I knew about you personally, and we know that that helps improve patient acceptance, patient retention, and case acceptance all across the board in a practice. So I'd work on next hygiene visit, I'd use the intro camera more, and I'd celebrate things with people. If I didn't have enough new patients, I'd ask for more new patients, and I'd track how often I did that. I, I want to I go back to intro camera. I, I always think it's ironic how um, a dental office, you know, their number one largest expense by far is labor, you know, 25, 28%. Next would be yeah, lab. 28%. It's probably it's probably north of 30, but yeah. So 30% labor. Then and then if the average dentist overhead is uh, 65%, that means the dentist that's a human that's labor. That's 35%. So so 30% for labor or say 25 and 35 for the dentist. That's 55 cents of every dollar goes to the human beings, which is the same average for the S and P 500. 55% goes to people, whether it be uh, payroll or profits. Um, the next lab, you know, eight to 10% percent supplies six percent. And they've always got money for payroll in the first and 15th, but they've never got any money to make their labor go smarter or faster. And what we did in our office, we, we have an intro camera in all eight operatories, and they're turned on in the morning. So, um, But in most offices you go to, you know, the dentist is trying to save a buck, and when he wants to use the intro camera, he's got to go to his sister. Oh, w w uh, would, would you go into room three? Gotta unplug it from here yeah. and plug it over yeah. here. Yeah. So, so you're stepping over pennies. I mean, you're you're just you're just wasting so much money because you're mm. going to have your whole office share an intro camera. But I want to go back to case acceptance because that's pretty confusing. I mean, um, some people say they have a hundred percent case acceptance rate, but they they don't present anything. Other people might um, present Invisalign ten times a week and at five thousand each. I mean, you know, if, if they got half of those, they'd be leaving $50,000 on the table. So that dings their case acceptance. Some people like Bill Blatchford, uh, who's, um, um, I think he's, is he 70? So 70 years old. He, he's, he's older than we are. Yeah. He, he's a, and you know what he does? He does a, he does a push up for every year he's alive, every year on his birthday and puts it on YouTube. And I can't do 52, but on, well, I I'll, think do, just, I'll do 60 of them tomorrow without any problem. Can you really do 60? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my God. I think uh, – but but he's, he says that um, to for every dollar you want to produce, you got to present three. He's saying – so a lot of his deal is, you know, if you want to do a million dollars, you got to present three million. Uh, so what, what do you – so what do you, what do you uh, talk a little bit more about case acceptance. Then I want you to talk about the other thing about case acceptance. Why do 95% of the country's 10,000 orthodontists – 
have a treatment plan presenter present the ortho treatment. 95% do. <laughs> and in dentistry, 95% do not. So I want you to come back to case acceptance because you're a panky dude. You're a Mercer dude. You guys know how to present big treatment plans. I bet you of our 7,000 listeners, it wouldn't surprise me if 5,000 of them have never done a single $10,000 case. So Maybe. can you can you talk about that for a little while? Yeah, let me, let me do it in reverse order. So, so first let me say, why does an orthodontist have, um, let's say, a non-dentist, and let me say an excellent communicator, somebody who's comfortable with numbers and math, comfortable with finding an acceptable way of, of paying for it, having treatment options, how, why do they have somebody present that instead of the dentist? And the simple answer to that one is because we generally, there's exceptions, we generally suck at doing that. And so if we're terrible at it, and we don't train somebody or pay somebody or incentivize somebody to do that, and we do the presenting of that, we're going to have a very, or whatever we have as an acceptance rate, but I'm going to assume it's going to be lower than it could have been because we're not good communicators. We have trouble looking somebody in the eye and saying it's ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. Now, is this true of everybody? Of course not. But we're talking about the bell curve. We've got the middle of the bell curve. They have a tough time presenting that. They can't even can't even look somebody in the, in the eye. They uh, the treatment's going to be, and they're afraid to say those numbers. They're also afraid that the patient's going to ask that question back that cripples everybody as a dentist. Will my insurance cover that? And they don't have an answer. And we need to have answers for that. So the reason the orthodontists do because they know orthodontists know we're always going to they're always going to be presenting a five, six, eight, ten thousand dollar treatment plan. And they know that their lifeblood is going to be the success of those presentations being accepted. So they are willing to invest in the people and the training to have somebody who is a more competent, let me say, treatment coordinator, salesman, whatever we want to call it, a closer, to be able to present that in a way that more of the patients, more of the patients and their parents will say yes. We're not willing to make that investment. Now, why can one person have a treatment acceptance rate that they think is 100% and somebody else, like Bill Blatchford, would suggest that if we want to have a million dollars in treatment acceptance, we have to present three million so that we get a two to one ratio that we get 33% case acceptance. That's a pretty wide range. Well, if I never present more than twelve or $1,500, I could grunt my way through that case presentation. I'd say, uh, grunt. And you'd say, oh, does my insurance cover you? Uh, and you'd go, let's go, right? I don't have to have any kind of interpersonal communication skills. So if I'm a dentist, I don't use my neocortex. I use my, I want you to like me mammalian brain, I use my, I don't want to feel the pain of rejection, reptilian brain, and I want to pay my bills, reptilian brain. I use my inner brains and I say, what's the least painful, what's the least emotionally costly path of resistance? And it's to ask you to do something that someone else will pay for. So that's where I go. So then I have 100%. Why? Because I never present more than what insurance will cover. Once I start going past, and I don't know what the number is, it's going to be different for everybody, three, four, five, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000, but probably three or $4,000. Now it really requires me creating a value proposition in your mind for what we're going to do. It, it, it requires me to help you understand what the role of insurance is and isn't. It requires me to help you make different choices about what you want, even though I know this is something that you need because you want other things. And we spend more money in this country today on alcohol, tobacco, and gambling than we do on dental care. We almost spend as much celebrating Halloween and Thanksgiving as we do on dental care. We spend $91 billion, and dentistry is a $110 billion industry. So people have money for what they want. So my, my goal isn't to tell you what you need, it's to get you to want it. So I, if I'm not a good communicator, Bill Blashford's right. I'm probably going to have to present $3 to get $1 back. So I either, I either default to the painless environment and say, I'm never going to present more than insurance covers, or I go over to this spectrum and I say, at this end, I'm going to present a whole bunch and I'm going to take my piece of it, but I'll have to be a three to one, two to one kind of ratio. Or, or maybe you spend more time honing your communication skills, honing your conversation and your scripts around insurance. You create more curiosity and co-discovery in the new patient exam. How are the kind of things we learned down at Panky? And if you do that and you invest at the front end of that, more, not every, more of those patients will come to understand the role of insurance. They'll come to understand what their needs are. Maybe they'll come to understand and want what we know they have to have done by them owning their problem, really good patient education. And if we do that, 
more of them will say yes. Not all of them, but more of them. So, but that's a harder track for a dentist to take. Why don't I just present more? Or why don't I present less where they'll always say yes? Those are paths of least resistance. So are you for treatment plan coordinator or against, or does it depend on the dentist? I mean, I mean, the, bo the bottom line is we all got in dental school for only one reason. We got A's in calculus, geometry, physics, chemistry, biochemistry. Uh, we, we didn't get, we didn't get accepted to dental town. I mean, to dental school, the same reason you get accepted to uh, a broker at Merle Lynch because you're tall, dark and handsome and know how to talk to right. people. So, so yeah. can this, can this physics major, calculus, Krebs cycle geek be taught to do this? Or do you think it's a lot easier to do like the orthodontists do and say, hey, just find a treatment plan coordinator? Bell curve answer, hire somebody to do it. Um, but some people um, may want to learn those skills and become better at that. And, and honestly, if they do, they'll probably be better at just about every other aspect of running their business. They'll be better at communicating with people. They'll be better leaders. They'll be better managers. They'll understand business better. So I would argue because of the size of our business, the, the, the revenue stake that we have, our cost of overhead, our cost of doing business, it's probably worth it, the average dentist taking a shot at trying to acquire those skills. Now, if they keep running into a brick wall all the time, then I think they've got to let go and think about hiring somebody else. But see, the average, the average orthodontic practice has a higher revenue run rate and lower overhead, and they've got a little bit more free capital to hire another other employee to do something like that and compensate them fairly. We're a little tighter on that. I mean, if, if you're using your 65%, for example, which I think would be great today, but 65, 70% overhead, you know, you're adding a layer of a person to do your job as a dentist that you're unable to do, and, and you got to pay them fairly. You're probably looking in a $700,000 practice or an $800,000 practice, you might be looking at another three, five, eight, or 10 points to hire that person. Well, if you're in an orthodontic practice doing a couple million dollars in revenue, it's a little easier story. So I'm, I'm in favor of both, depending on what you can and can do as an individual. I, um, I, I know two ladies my age, well, not my age, but <clears throat> maybe 10 years, five years younger, who both um, went and got a job at a dental office uh, doing 500000 Both started presenting the treatment. They both went to a million five. They were both getting paid about uh, $15 an hour and asked for $20 an hour raise, and the dentist said no found uh, another office hire him, so gave two weeks notice and went there. The office that was doing 500000 went to a million five. They left. It went back down to 500000 And where they're at so now uh, went from 500000 to a million and a half. And one of them had to do it again and went to a third office, and that one went back down to five hundred. And I mean, can you imagine a lady comes into your office, bumps you up a million dollars, and you can't bump her from $15 an hour to twenty? I mean, I mean, dentists are, I mean, that, that, these are two of the craziest examples I've ever seen on treatment yeah. plan. Acceptance. I'm trying to get them to do an online C course on treatment plan. Um, acceptance. So, so if you're a dentist listening to this and, um, and they want to know more, I mean, how, how would you take them to the next level? They're, they're driving to work right now on the average commutes about an hour. That's why these podcasts are an hour. Um, we're, we're halfway through this, um, where, where do you want to go next? You want you want to tell them how to do this? Do you want to tell them, you know, what would their next step be? You mean telling the dentist how to do it? Yeah. Well, I, I think... Or, 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 do you, or do you recommend the person listening on their way to work now uh, go there and start looking for a treatment plan coordinator? I, I, I would, again, probably... I would probably take a shot at how to develop my own skills first. And then if I was unable to do that running into a brick wall, I would hire somebody to do it and have to bite that bullet. And, but, and, you, know, and you know what? I think what you said, uh, why they should learn how to do it themselves, is because... Becoming a successful salesperson, you're going to become successful all around your life because Absolutely. one of the biggest maxims, I believe, of successful <clears throat> people is how many uncomfortable conversations are you willing to talk about? I mean, these people will tell you things about their own kids and I'll say, well, when you told your kid, what, what did they say? Oh, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I'm afraid to tell my kid that. Or, and they're telling you what they want to say to the, to the hygienist and they're like, well, you know, I, I don't want to confront her. And, and these people are always telling me these conversations and I'm always like, you shouldn't be having this conversation with me because you're venting. It'll make you feel better. You need to go back and have an uncomfortable conversation with your hygienist. Uh, they, they won't talk about their, their spouse spending too much money. They just, they just, humans are pack animals, so they don't like to have uncomfortable conversations. That's what sales is. Sales is being able to say, Mark, look, you know, you got insurance, but uh, dude, 
you know, to do this right, that this is going to be a very comprehensive case, and this is going to cost you ten grand. Or so that, that's why they age develop themselves. It'll, it'll help in every Absolutely aspect great. of their life. And, and you know how, Howard, that the challenge, the challenge inside the dentist is not go out and learn the skills. The challenge inside the average dentist is to accept the fact that we'd rather talk about molar endo than talk about interpersonal communication. And so the, the first step in recognizing that we need to grow into an area is recognizing the deficiency we have in that area and the need that we have in that area. And that's a huge challenge because that requires a big paradigm shift. You know, the reason that molar endo and stuff like that are the number one threads on dental town is because that's our four-inch Munson radius sphere. That's our comfort zone. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we want to think about. That's what we were trained to do. That's what we're good at. We weren't selected, you said it, we weren't selected to go to dental school because we were good interpersonal communicators, good providers, good healers, good nurturers. We didn't have a list of characteristics that they looked for. They said, they said, let me test you for the characteristics of somebody who would get through this program in four years and pass the boards. And that's an introvert who's very uh, analytical and technical in terms of their work, not strong in interpersonal communications, doesn't have great leadership and management skills. Oh, are there exceptions? Of course. But we're talking about the bell curve all the time. So if there's somebody out there listening who wants to get pissed off because I said that about them as a dentist, it's a bell curve. We got both ends. But the average dentist is not, not only not trained, they're not selected for, and then they're not prepared to accept in themselves that they need help in that arena. And then to pay for it. And yet they'll pay for a class on molar endo, a class ass on occlusion. I mean, that, I mean look, at the, look at the continuing education. There's one, and now I'm going to plug Panky for a second, where I teach, but, I mean, Spear does a great job. Koist does a great job. Dawson, LVI, all those places, they do a great job in technical education. It's harder to find a place, Panky, where there's a stronger component on the behavioral, the philosophical side, the softer sides of dentistry. It's harder to find that. Why? Because that's not what they want. And if I was opening a commercial enterprise and I wanted to sell continuing education, I would sell as much technical education as people would buy because that's what they want. And I'd sell the hell out of it. And I wouldn't discount it. I'd bundle it and I'd make a bunch of money. But if you said, give me what I need, I'd say, you need to learn how to hug somebody. You need to learn how to reward somebody. You need to learn how to communicate well. You need to know how to, how to stand up for what's right in the face of adversity and resistance. And that's harder to do, and that's harder to teach. And if I'm a dentist, I don't want to learn how to do that stuff. I just, I just want to work here. I just want to fix this stuff. Oh, you so know, the first you'll, step is admitting. You'll go into dental offices, and everybody I know in consulting says the same thing. When you go into a million-dollar office where the doctor's netting three, four, or five, I mean, you can sense it in one second. Like, you, you go into other doctor's appointments, and, like, the doctor's running 30 minutes late, and there's just people just vividly upset. You go into our office, and we know the doctor's going to be late, and it's just a natural behavior for the office manager, the receptionist, to get up there, stand up, walk around, go out there, hold your hand. Mark, I'm so sorry. Dr. Ferran's running late. He And then explain the whole thing, and the patient's like, I mean, and then when you talk to dentists about stuff like that, they go, oh, that's all the soft stuff. That's all the bullshit. I, uh, you know, I, I want to know on, on, on a Cirac machine, do you have the setting on this, or do you have this? I mean, it's just... In fact, in fact, what would what, what even address that? These kids are coming out of $250,000 in student loans, and they're all freaked out because now they got to double down and pay $150,000 for a CAD CAM, $100,000 for a CBCT, and $75,000 for a BioLace. And they're like, they're going to double their dental school debt on three toys. So what yeah. would you say to that dentist? Do, do they need to double their dental school debt to go to the next level on three toys? Well, I certainly don't think so. I certainly don't think so. Um, I think I think you that certainly ways. know so that they don't. I mean, how many how many dentists do you know have multi million dollar practices that don't have any three of those devices? Plenty. Plenty. Yeah, and they'll get those three devices, and they don't have the skill set to get to a million dollar practice uh, anyway. That's right. It's it's yeah. We look for the quick answer. We look for the easy solution. And when, when a very slick salesman, which we're not, walks in and tells us that this CIRAC, this CBCT, that these things are the answer to our problems, they're going to make all our, our concerns go away, um, you know, we want to buy into that hope because they're good salespeople and it's cool looking equipment and it's snazzy and we like that kind of stuff and that's our comfort zone again. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with CIRAC machines sitting in the corner, barely using them. 
that that don't have that opportunity to really grow their practice with them. Now you take that that practice where somebody's running behind, somebody's stressed, but has a good team with all those soft skills. If you can teach those same soft skills to the dentist, if you can teach the dentist good communication skills, if you can teach the dentist to be like the rest of their team that's around them, that dentist can take his number from whatever it is to whatever he wants it to be and work as many or as few hours as he wants. We can carve our own path in dentistry. Okay, we so don't have to have to be slaves to this insurance crap. So, Mark, now now this uh, little girl is uh, thirty years old, and now she's only uh, she's two thirds way to work. She's only got twenty minutes left. Specifically, she she says, "Okay, I agree, Mark. I I, I want to go to the next level." What specifically should she do? Um, I mean, should she start with uh, the functional tracker? Should she start with the pink suit? Should she go to functionaltracker.com? I mean, I mean, what what can? By the way, can she email you? A lot of them. Every dentist always thinks their problem is unique. They say, Mark, you don't understand. I'm in this town, and it's only five thousand, and the main factory shut down, and you don't get it because you're not from you know around here. So can that person ask you a specific Absolutely. question? And how do they Absolutely. contact you? Would Mark you go- Murphy. Mark Murphy at functionaltracker.com. Functional with a K. So M-A-R-K-M-U-R-P-H-Y, Mark Murphy at functionaltracker.com. Okay, so what would her next step be? She says, okay, I, I, I want to go to this next level. Specifically, what should she do and in what order? Now, he, and here's the challenge. What everybody wants right now when they ask that question is they want the action item answer. And they want it to be something fuzzy and sexy and something they can get their hands around. And they want it to be a big, hairy, audacious answer to their problems. And the first thing they should do... And it has to be shiny with lights on it. Absolutely. That's squirrel. <laughs> and, and absolutely. And, and what they really need to do is to go sit by a beach, sit by a campfire, sit with someone they care about, and talk about what their vision is for how they want to practice dentistry. Because until we get clear on how we really want to do this stuff we call dentistry... It's really hard for us to design a path on how to get there. You know, Yogi Bear said, if you, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up somewhere else. I love that. You know, so <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, how the heck can you ask questions? Like, how do you, how do you say, Howard, should I, uh, should I buy the cone beam or should I send my patients out for the cone beam? You say, I don't know. Tell me about your practice. Tell me about your vision. Uh, should I go with digital radiography? Should I uh, start making bite splints and centric relations? Should I go to LVI where they teach neuromuscular? Should I go to Panky where they teach CR? I don't know. Tell me about your vision. Well, until I know what your vision is, it's really hard for me to help you make decisions about which path you want to take. So first, I would vision for who I wanted to be, how I wanted to practice, how I saw my my patient population, how I saw my team. And I'd have to let myself go far enough out, three, five, seven years, to think not tomorrow, not in six months, because then there's an impossibility of getting there that prevents you from thinking clearly. You have to be able to say, in five years, I'd like to be, and maybe somebody said, in five years, I'd like to be practicing independent of insurance. I'd like to have patients who were responsible for themselves and their mouths. I'd like to have a team that was you know, self-starting and took care of things. I'd like to have better communication skills. I'd like to have really good case acceptance. I'd like to work four, hours, four, four days a week, six or seven hours a day. Paint that picture as clearly as you can. Once you have that vision, then I would say go get the skill sets you need to acquire that vision as a reality. And those skill sets might be clinical because maybe, maybe you're living in a triple-tray world doing doing one tooth at a time, and maybe you want to do more comprehensive care, then you'll need some skills. So you might need some clinical skills that you have to add into your, your toolbox. You might need some communication skills. You might need some behavioral skills. You might need some leadership skills, some management skills, business skills. Go get that stuff. Once you get that stuff on the shelf, clinical skills, behavioral skills, communication skills, then start to deliver. Now, this is the hard part, because now you're probably going to deliver a higher quality patient experience without really getting paid for it. Because you're still living in this PPO, usual customary and reasonable world. You're still in this insurance entitlement, and you're starting to deliver more. But here's the good part. I'd, now I'd work on something like tracking behaviors, whether it was functional track or your own mechanism. I would start to track the behaviors, grow my practice, get busy, and I would really work hard to deliver a higher value proposition to my patients, both in terms of quality of the clinical work and the behavioral experiences they have in the practice. Now, after I've done that for a while, then I would spend some time telling those patients about the great experience they're having, reminding those patients that what they're getting here, they didn't get at their previous dentist. What they're getting here, they're not going to get somewhere else, that my filling, my crown is better. And, and patients don't always know that difference. But if we point out that we spend some time carving some anatomy into that composite restoration, if we spend some time explaining to them that we're going to make an exquisite provisional restoration today, 
we'll have you back in four or five weeks after that tissue's healed. Because if we try to take an impression today, we won't know exactly where the margin is, and we'll have a more predictable result by treating your tissues this way. That makes sense to patients. And if they say, gosh, I remember my previous dentist, you know, just injecting and trying to get an impression and cussing and swearing and taking three or four of them because he had to get it off to the lab and get it back in two weeks, no one ever said to me, we could let those tissues heal first. So if we can create a differentiating experience and, and share that value proposition with the patients, I've, I've gone and put good stuff on the shelf, I have this vision, I do some better stuff, I deliver it to the patients, I tell them about it, now I'm prepared to risk leaving my relationship with insurance. So if that's somebody's vision, then they can create a pathway that's three or four or five years long of delivering the kind of dentistry that they want in the kind of environment that they want, maybe not for full compensation initially, and then they're willing to risk the loss of a few of those patients. And it probably won't be as many as you'd like or as many as you'd worry about if you if you do it the right way. And, and I would suggest you don't leave all at once. You leave the worst plans first and you leave the less worst plans second and third. And then maybe you write a letter to those patients, explain to them what's happening. And then you have them come in for six months and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each and every person that's going to be infected by that decision. I would have a slow and careful, progressive way of moving towards my dream. But it starts with vision. It starts with vision. They need to put the stuff on the shelf. You have to grow a little bit and deliver some great stuff. And then you got to tell people you're delivering it so they understand the value proposition. Then you can start to risk leaving some of those insurance reimbursements. Now, specifically, would you recommend that they sign up for the functional tracker and go to Panky? You know, my, my knee-jerk answer is, you know, probably yes, but but that I can't really say that to somebody because it depends. Well, well, if your the, vision is, if your right. vision is, or your desire is, I just want to learn really good clinical dentistry, then I, I don't know that Panky is the right place for everybody. Because Panky's going to burden you down with some communication skills and behavioral and help you develop a philosophy. They're going to spend some time helping you vision how you want to practice, talk to you about your core values and your patients. They're going to talk about fluffy stuff. And if you go, I just want clinical dentistry, there might be better places out there for you. How, mu how, much, how, how much week one, is it still like um, when I went there where it's uh – a a week uh, continuum at a time. I, I went yes. to. I, I went there five times for a week. Yep. By the way, what was that hotel across the street from Panky on the on the beach? Oh, uh, the Sinesta. Sinesta. Oh my yeah. God, my kids love that Beautiful. place. Yeah. Beautiful. So, would you recommend um, just going down to week one at the Panky and giving it a shot? How much is week one? How often do they teach that? Um, spe specifics about that. Yeah, I, I think Panky offers uh, E1, and I teach in all the ones and all the threes. I think they offer E1 six or seven times a year, have about 16 students in a class. Um, I think it's around four grand. Can't quote me on that. And then we've got condominiums that they get to stay in. And because we're a nonprofit, they're a lot cheaper than staying in the local hotels. Um, and, and the experience at E1 is primarily about understanding occlusion, understanding the new patient examination, how to create some of this curiosity and co-discovery. And then you start on a journey about self-discovery and looking at, you know, Dr. Panky's crosses, I'm sure you recall, knowing yourself, knowing your patient, knowing your work, applying your knowledge, and then you'll have rewards in the center of that kind of balanced uh, construct that you have that'll be both spiritual and financial, monetary and behavioral, because it's not just enough to make good money. You got to feel good about it in your heart. And it's not just enough to get warm fuzzies you need to make a couple of bucks because you got to pay your bills. So that's what E1 is all about. And I think that is a great place for most people to start. Now, then you'll go through two and you'll learn more about occlusion and TMD and splint therapy. And three, you'll do aesthetics. And four, you'll do posterior reconstruction and implants. And so there's a, there's a, a layering to the learning. But throughout that, there's a thread of behavioral practice management, financial management. So, so is Panky right for everybody? No, but it's, it's right for a lot of the young generation. That, you know, Panky's doing better today than they were before. They've still got a lot of competition out there. Back when you and I were going there, there was Panky, there was Dawson, there wasn't much else. Now there's 10 or 15 good places to get an education. I mean, good places. And I've been to a bunch of them. I've been to Spear. I've been to Dawson. I've been to Coise. I, you know, I've, I've been to LVI. So I've done a lot of different stuff. And Panky's got some uniqueness to it. And as a nonprofit, it's got some uniqueness to it. Is It has a commercial-free, unbiased kind of approach. The functional trackers... I, 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 want, I want to add, before you go to the functional tracker, sure. um, specifically, do you think for week one, I mean, there's two experiences you can have. I mean, you can go take your family, stay at the Sinesta, do yeah. Panky uh, 8 to 5, or do you recommend they go solo, solo and stay in the dorms where you have three or four people and make it a, uh, a personal, private, solo yeah. journey instead of uh, chasing your kids on the beach? 
This one, I would not say it depends. This one, I would say solo. You for would go solo. all continuums or, or, or most specifically for one? Or what, what are you thinking? I would say for all of the continuums, you want to plan on going solo. If you want to have your family down, have them come at the end or go there at the beginning and maybe overlap a day with you. But your time from, uh, from 8 to 5 in the classroom doesn't end there. Usually you break for dinner, then there's an evening session, or everyone's getting together in the condos and they're meeting. And that after hours learning, the after hour experience is so much a part of what of how you grow and what you do and what you learn at Panky that I would try not to compromise that by having outside interests. Um, we, had, we had our wives come down when we were at four. We had the wives come down and join us like on Thursday. and We finished up on Friday. And then we did something on the weekend that three of us got together with our, with our wives, the so three couples, and we had a nice weekend and everything together. That's a great way to do it. But I would, uh, I would probably not uh, try to bring a family down during it. And, and how much is the functional tracker? Is this something you download on online, or is this something that it's all in the cloud? or is this It's some, cloud. It's, it's all, yeah, all cloud-based? How does this all, work? It's all cloud-based. How much is it, and how does it work? It's, uh, it's $395 a month is the, the full manufacturer suggested retail price, price, and there's, of course, a million different ways to get to that. But it's an online cloud-based behavioral tracking mechanism because change is hard. Our reptin brains and our mammalian brains want to take over. We've got to figure out a way to get the neocortex in charge. And so it's sort of like a Fitbit for a dental practice. It's sort of like my fitness pal for a dental practice. And we've had tremendous results and tremendous growth with those, as well as we have with our consulting clients. But we've had a lot of fun with those trackers really producing some results. And so this is something would um, – okay, what, what percent of the offices do you say are paperless charts, all digital? What, what, what percent of dental offices would you say are digital x-ray, paperless? Maybe 25. 25 maybe 25% are all digital. Maybe 25% are all digital. Maybe uh, 45, 50 have digital radiography, something like that. Maybe 60% today. But I'm, I'm trying to um, – this person driving is still trying to picture – is this – Something that um, in a paperless office, like the, the it'd be on the hygienist monitor, it'd be on everybody's monitor, so the hygienist would track her day. Or is, this, or is so, this something that the office manager does, or is this something the dentist you does? Should, in, you'd you'd want to have a terminal. In, you'd want to have a, um, a computer or a terminal in the back. You'd want to have a computer or a terminal at the admin site. Uh, each hygienist would want to have their own terminal. If you didn't have a terminal in all those locations, they could use a, an iPhone, or they could use a, a Droid, they could use an iPad, they could use anything that got them on the on the internet. That office would just have to have internet access. And then the way it works out is, uh, we ask them a bunch of questions. They answer those. There's an algorithm that suggests what the best opportunities are in their practice. Once those opportunities are displayed to them, they they approve of those tracker selections. And each team member gets four different four trackers that their team is doing to improve their success, lower their stress, make more money. We, we really just want to take the stress out of managing a dental practice as much as we can with this kind of virtual coaching. I, I like to tell people, Howard, it's like having a coach or a consultant for a fraction of the price. Do you get the full Monty, like Mark Murphy's coming into your practice for two or three days, or Kathy Jameson, or Kirk Barrett? No, you don't get that same experience. But for a fraction of the cost, you know, if it's 395 bucks for four or $5,000 a year, and if you grow 10 or 15%, that's a pretty good investment. And that's a pretty good return on your investment. So how long has this been out, and have you functional tracked your own success with dentists using this? And what's, what, what, what is your own functional uh, tracking success with this program? How long has it been out, and what kind of success are you seeing with dental offices? We, we launched right at the turn of the year with a full beta test. Uh, so in January of 2015, we went live with a group of dental practices. We had some practices on alpha tests before that. Some of the practices get a little bit of coaching on top of this. So it's if we if we clump them all together, because the end isn't large in the beginning, we've got an 18% average growth of the practice. The worst practice we had grew about $280 per day. So that's about $45 or $50,000 on an annual basis for a uh, less than $5,000 investment. Well worth their time, effort, energy, and money. Um, do, they, do, we, have, do, do they have to sign a, uh, um, a year-long commitment or just a, a monthly automatic credit no. card ding, or how, how does this work? Thank, that great, great question. We will ding their credit card on a monthly basis. They can prepay for the year and get a little extra month at the end of the year, so they can get 13 months for the price of 12. We'll do that because we don't have to do all the billing. But no, uh, you don't like what you're getting. You don't like what you're working. Fire me as fast as you'd fire anybody else, just like you're firing the guy that cuts your lawn or the person that cuts your hair. You just uh, you, you, you speak with your credit card, so to speak. What if I don't hire anyone to cut my hair? <laughs> well, you're, you're as lucky as I am. <laughs> I'm as lucky as you. So, um, 
so you so you're having good success with this then? Yeah, we have been. Um, and we've got some strategic alliance partnerships with um, with some groups, and so that's an advantage for them as well. Um, but it's it's really been a fun tracker. We're we're just getting into the full launch of it now, so it's it's kind of fun. Um, we're we're waiting for that overwhelming uh, number of signups and subscriptions to come about, and uh, we think we've got a very formidable project, and we think got a very formidable way of helping people reduce their stress in their practice, manage their team, make a few bit more bucks, and. And have more patients have healthier mouths without spending a ton do, of money. Do you think um, this might be um, a new online CE course for you where you kind of explained it to where some people uh, could see all the bells and whistles and say, I'll do it myself? Or other people, it would kind of be marketing where they'd say, God, that's nice. I want to do it. I mean, do you, do you think that would be an online CE course? Well, I'd love it to be an online CE course, and I mean, I'd love to do that and, and do it for you on Dental Town, of course, because you guys have such a, and I've done some of those before. Because you, um, that's, what is, the name of your course right now is, um, is key, uh, it's measuring the, measuring the, course the right stuff, is, key yeah, practice, right, right indicators. Yeah, and, and what that really well, is, when is did that, that course set? go live? Um, I think just about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, it went live, and that was from the townie meeting in April. And does that kind of explain what you're doing? I would say yes, it does. It certainly explains, and, and it'll even say during that lecture, I'll say to people, it's not about how you track. Our software does a really nice job of that, and it's fairly inexpensive, but it's the, it's about that you track. It's more important that you track. And whether you do it with paper and pencil, whether you do it with a spreadsheet in Excel, or whether you do it with my software, it's about tracking behaviors. Yeah, I got a cool software. It's fun to use. You know, there's avatars and badges, so people have fun with it like they do with some of the other online stuff. It's not quite as fun as Candy Crush, but it's pretty cool. But the idea being, it's about tracking. I want to make tracking easy. I want to make it software. I want to make it cloud-based. But it's about tracking. That's what's so critical. And a lot of, a lot of the uh, science says that if a person just starts to weigh themselves every day, they'll start losing weight. If they just start to pay attention to overhead or, or like if you go into a dental office and just get <clears throat> the whole team to realize what they have to do to break even, yep. you'll, you'll stop having days where you lose money just because the whole team realizes, but God, if we have to do 3800 just to pay, the, pay all the bills so that they, yep. it totally changes their behavior to work in an emergency or fill that cancellation or, or what have you. Let me, let me tell you a story about that that fits perfectly because what gets measured gets done. There's no question about it. So this is true. If you take a practice and you say to them, so how many, what percentage of your patients do you think is leaving with the next appointment? They're going to tell you whatever the number is. And most people will grossly overestimate. So immediately I tell them, well, whatever you think it is, it's probably less, but let's do this. Let's do this. Go back to your practice, take out a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle and put a tick mark every time somebody come in for a hygiene appointment on the left side, and when they have a six-month recare appointment, put a tick mark on the right. Do it till you get 100 appointments from last month here on the left. Add up the right-hand side. Tell me what your percentage is. And it's going to be the average practice is around 70%. Whatever that number is, tell your team that you measured it. Just tell your team that you measured it. Tell your team you're going to measure it again in one month. Don't do anything else. You and I know the number will go up. Just as soon as everybody knows we're being measured on a certain behavior with no coaching, none of my videos, none of my articles, none of that stuff, with, with nothing, but just knowing you're going to have to get on that scale again, like you said, in the next month, you'll eat better. Or in this case, as a hygienist, I'll make more of my next hygiene appointments. So, so without any coaching, without any special trackers, that number will get better just because they know I'm going to measure it. That's how powerful measurement is. Now, uh, we, we never got to Mercer. Are you still with Mercer? No, you know, Mercer really doesn't exist anymore. Um, Mercer as an investment company still ex exists. Um, the, the investment capital company that bought them divested themselves of the consulting side and picked it up primarily, I think, for the transitions, buying and selling of dental practices. But I think for the most part, they've allowed the rest of that company to become very, very quiet. And the only thing you see over at Patterson that's a remnant of Mercer seems to be their transition side, which they've got some really good people there that do a really nice job. And then on the investment side, Mercer still does a very nice job, you know, in terms of handling dentist retirement assets. I think they manage about $5 billion with a B, $5 billion worth of dentist retirement assets, and they do a great job. And, and in all your years there, uh, you only got two minutes. Any, any, uh, anything you picked up on <clears throat> transition or, uh, or retirement needs? Yeah, tr transition, I, I think if you're young enough, I'd sell half my practice. Grow it some more, sell another half again maybe, grow it some more. I'd sell it in halves, put that money in the bank and save it. 
Um, from a from a consulting standpoint, they were at one time the largest consulting company in the country for dentists, and and they did a very very nice job. Um, they had a software that um, was called OnTrack that did a nice job of tracking some behaviors, and I think that was, if you will, that was the the thought process is that anytime we can start to track behaviors, we can start to impact results in a more profound way. Uh, unfortunately, with them not being around anymore, we kind of lose that kind of initiative. And so what we've tried to do is create a software that was it's far easier to use. It's got gamification in it, so it's fun to use, hence the name, you know, the name functional instead of with a C with a K. So it's a little fun and funky. And uh, I think it's about making sure we identify and drive the right behaviors so that we can get the right kind of results. So they can log on to Dental Town and see your course on that. That was that was a two hour course, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, that, that, that was an outstanding course. So, so that was a two hour course there. Um, we are out of time. It's been one hour. We're over the hour. Hey, Mark, <clears throat> seriously, dude, I, I just want to say that uh, you've been a role model and an, uh, an idol of mine uh, during my entire career. Uh, seriously, I, I mean, you, re- you really have. I and, and like I say, you, uh, I, I mean, you've been a Mercer and Pinky. Um, you're always an innovator. I hope everyone, if they log on to uh, www.functional with a F, F U N K, let's get funky, T I O N A L tracker.com. Is there some type of demo or something? Or Yeah, there's a, there's a video on there that shows you how the software works, how it's gamified, how it changes behaviors, tracks the behaviors. And then and if they've got some interest in that, then they can go ahead and sign up. And, uh, and if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a townie, we'll do something nice for them. How's that? Is, is that video on your website? Is that on a YouTube video? Is that a YouTube link? Uh, it is not a YouTube video. We, we store those on Vimeo in a private Vimeo account. Okay. So certainly could. I certainly would put it on YouTube if somebody wanted to watch it. Yeah, well, I, I, again, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for all that you've done oh. for dentistry. Thank you so much for all that you've done for Dentaltown. I'm a big fan of your posts on, on Dentaltown, and uh, I hope everybody that's driving to work thinking, I, I need to do something. I, I need to get to the next level. I'm well, there. Well, Howard, I've got to say back to you, thank you for all the innovation you've provided us in dentistry with, with a venue like Dentaltown and to have the foresight and, and the energy to do something like that because there still is nothing quite like that anywhere in dentistry or in any of the other professions that allow this kind of community to have the kind of involvement they do and make a difference. Oh, yeah, things get goofy on there sometimes, but isn't that fun? They get goofy. They get serious. There's all kinds of great conversations that you'll have on those threads in there. A lot so, of fun stuff. so I'll give you the goofiest conversation on there right now is the, the, the biggest exploding threat I've seen in my whole life was on Cecil the Lion. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I can imagine. Oh my gosh, that I uh, that was a, that's the wildest threat I've ever seen. Because the neat yeah. thing about those emotional conversations is, uh, you know, everybody there has got their dentist. They've all got eight years of college, and the, that's what I like the most about Dental Town is that you think you know it all. I mean, I don't care what, if it's on uh, anything, yeah. and the dentist that they they just they always show you something you've never thought about once. Last question, I can't resist. Sure. Last question here is this. This is the overtime question. Um, a lot bonus, of bonus question. The bonus question. A lot of young kids are thinking neuromuscular CR. I mean, I how do 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 I have to learn them both to see what's right? What what would your answer to be? Before it's a young kid and they don't want to they don't want to go down a path five miles to circle around and come back and go down another path. Yeah. So neuromuscular or CR. Am, am, am I going to get you in trouble? Let me give you a one-word answer. I'm going to say CR because 95% of the world walks, talks, and breathes that way. But there's probably some value in every occlusal school of thought we have, including you know, um, you know, um, not just neuromuscular and centric relation, but nathology and uh, bioesthetics. There's, all those have merit. But if I just had to give you a quick answer, I'd say I'd have to lean in CR. And I would have to say, um, uh, I know we both have our fellowship in the Academy of General. I, I would have to say that um, if, if you wouldn't learn how to do all orthodontics from A to Z and never did a single ortho case, you'd be a much better dentist. It's all cross-training. It's all cross-training. And you, you come Amen. out of school and your toolbox has a hammer and a screwdriver. And every time you go to the course, you just keep getting more and more tools and right now at 28 years of practicing it's so fun to walk into a room and look at a mouth and think i could fix this eight different ways you know what i mean so it's all Absolutely good right. but again mark thank you so much for all that you do for dentistry hey and from the motor city peace out <laughs> okay bye-bye